Hello everybody. For a long time people have been fascinated by phenomena such as swarm intelligence and some scientists and engineers have been thinking couldn't we create something like a superorganism with super intelligence? Well, maybe we can. And today I'm going to propose to build a planetary nervous system as a citizen web. Since the invention of the computer, we have gone a long way. In the beginning, some people thought, oh, there would be a world market for maybe five computers. But how wrong these people were. And this is because computers were connected with each other. It all started with ARPANET that connected a number of military computers. But it was soon opened up for everyone, for the public. And so the internet was created as civilian communication network of the world. And this opened up so many wonderful opportunities for the world and started off the digital revolution. Tim Berners-Lee came and invented the HTTP protocol and in this way web pages could be connected with each other. The World Wide Web was invented and was opened up basically for everyone, for non-experts, was easy to use and was possible to create commercial applications. So it became a big business case. In the meantime, about a billion people are connected with each other through social networks. And so the question is, could we basically build collective intelligence within this social network? And how would we have to do that? Well, I don't have a definite answer to this, but I have a number of thoughts and I hope this will be a little bit interesting for you. But we also need to think about the next big step of the digital revolution. And I think this will be the Internet of Things. Already now there are more machines and gadgets and sensors connected to the Internet than people. And in about 10 years time there will be 150 billion of such sensors, gadgets and machines. That means it will be possible that machines will talk to machines, that machines talk to people, people to machines. So all of that will happen, and so basically future networks will involve both humans and artificial intelligence and connect to each other. And verbal computing is of course at the heart of collecting information through wearable sensors, and this will be very important to collect all the important information that we need to improve our health and our living conditions, our social interactions, and so on. So with all these big data about human activities now becoming available, what could we do? Well, we could certainly create new instruments to explore and improve the world. In the very same way as we have created telescopes and microscopes in the past, we could build something like socioscopes to, in order to understand basically our social and economic world. And we would need to get a lot of data and put it together in order to create a digital map of the world. And it's not so difficult, in fact. A colleague of mine, Mark Polyface and his team, they have collected millions of pictures from Flickr. And from this they have actually reconstructed the Colosseum in Rome and many other places in the world as 3D reconstruction. So you can do that basically from your desk at home and you can basically see any place in the world through the eyes of so many people who take all those pictures. We could also create new compasses for decision makers and those could show things that are intangible that we haven't been able to measure and see in the past, such as social capital, that means reputation, trust, solidarity, compliance and also happiness. We could measure that actually more or less in real time and in a disaggregated way that means broken down to countries, cities and even quarters of cities. So that will be very helpful to take better decisions. We could map change of the environment and who causes it. We could map resources and who 
uses them and this is useful of course in order to get an idea of the resilience of our supply networks such as the European gas supply and already some months ago we've been warning that we need to have solutions for particular political scenarios so all of that requires basically a mapping of the world onto data could map tensions and how they come about in order to avoid conflict hopefully and we would be able to come up with maps of risks and crises and of disease spreading but what else could we do besides this? Oh well, we could also map innovations, the flow of ideas or also the spreading of culture as this video shows you so this associates a publication that came out very recently in science and it shows you how America after its discovery was basically filled with culture in the course of time but how to use all these data in a top-down or in a bottom-up way well could we create something like a benevolent dictator or a wise king I mean could anybody with all this information could, could he or she take the best possible decisions for the world? Could we in this way basically optimize the state of the world and create the best possible of all worlds? Well, let's have a look at these curves over here. The blue curve shows the processing power over time and you can see this exponential growth where processing power doubles every 18 months. Compared to this, the data volume shown in green is also increasing exponentially but at a fa much faster rate it's doubling every 12 months and this basically has a number of implications first of all, we are moving from an age, an area where we didn't have enough data to take good decisions into an area where we can take evidence-based decisions using big data and of course that will allow us to take better decisions but we also see that eventually more and more of the data that we have cannot be processed anymore that means there will be an increasing fraction of dark data it means that we would pay attention to certain things and not to others and we would probably overlook certain kind of things as it has happened with the financial crisis with the Arab Spring or also with the spreading of the Islamic State fighters. There was information around that people just didn't pay attention to it. So, having all the data in the world doesn't necessarily mean that we would take the right decisions. And then, further on, look at this red curve. This shows systemic complexity in the course of time. As we go on networking the world, this is exploding even faster than processing power and data volumes and it basically means that we will not be able to optimally uh, take top-down decisions actually we will need a different way of managing systems and we'll have to go towards distributed control towards self-regulating systems and this is actually where the Internet of Things will be really of prime importance. So, summarizing this, what I'm saying is as the complexity of the system increases, we need to have a higher level of autonomy for the system components in order to reach our goals. And that means we have to go from top-down control to a culture of empowerment. Here is a picture that basically illustrates today's situation. We're trying often to control every single decision and action that people take. But it has led to a situation of overregulation. And instead, we should go towards a system where we have institutions and infrastructures that support people in taking the right decisions and uh, effective actions. And here is a movie which is illustrating that self-organization, self-regulation can actually work surprisingly well. 
And the reason for this is the particular design of this intersection. What we have here is a unidirectional flow in the front from left to right, and in the back there is the opposite unidirectional flow from right to left. Additionally, in the center we have a small buffer that allows people to adjust their speed such that they would find a gap in the traffic flow when they want to cross. So the question is, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of institutions would we need for the digital society and the digital economy. The dream to create self-regulating systems is very old, it's at least 300 years old, and here is actually a book, The Table of Bees, that was published exactly in 1714, which suggested that our society could work like a beehive, I mean, be wonderfully self-organized. There is, in fact, a queen bee, but the queen bee basically lays eggs, it doesn't give out commands to all the other bees. But still there is this almost perfect order and self-organization based on local interactions between the bees. And some people have asked themselves, couldn't our society work like this? And Adam Smith is well known for this idea of the invisible hand that would basically coordinate people's decisions and actions. But unfortunately, so far, the invisible hand has often failed to do a good job. And besides the financial meltdown and crisis, there are, for example, these tragedies of the commons, such as environmental pollution, overfishing, and climate change that neither business nor politics managed to solve so far. But now, I believe that 300 years later, we can actually make the invisible hand work by using the Internet of Things to get real-time data needed for real-time feedbacks that would enable the self-regulation and would require complexity science to understand how to build these systems. So, basically, we need to deploy the sensor networks that would be behind the Internet of Things. And uh, with the real-time data that these sensors would gather, we could overcome problems such as this terrible stop-and-go traffic that we're suffering from almost every day. So you can see a simulation of the stop-and-go traffic in the beginning, and then eventually we'll check out whether we can overcome this problem by local interactions, by changing the interaction mechanism. We call that mechanism design. And for this, let us turn this car into a helicopter to see what's the origin of the stop and go traffic. And it turns out it's a few vehicles that are trying to get into the freeway. This causes small perturbations, and those perturbations are amplified because traffic flow is unstable, and that creates stop and go traffic. But now we'll equip the cars with radar sensors. Um, and these radar sensors measure the distances and relative velocities of cars and then cars driving in an autonomous way based on local interaction. That's basically, basically work of, uh, on self-driving cars that we did with Volkswagen seven years ago and longer ago. And as you can see over here, we are able to overcome stop-and-go traffic by increasing the capacity of the flow and stabilizing traffic flows. Well, the question is, how efficient is actually self-regulation? And for this, let me discuss another example, which is typical for an NP-HAR optimization problem in a largely variable system, which is hardly predictable. And this is traffic control in urban areas. So, let us compare three different organizations of traffic light control. The classical approach is basically to have a traffic control center that's collecting data from all over the city and integrating them, it's trying to figure out the best possible solution. And that cannot be done in real time because of the empty hardness. And anyway, then commands are given out to all the traffic lights, and so this basically works like a benevolent dictator. Now, 
In contrast, we could have a bottom-up self-organization when every single intersection tries to minimize the travel times of all the cars that are approaching that intersection. It's not very difficult to implement that actually. So it's basically the idea of the homo economicus where each intersection is like a homo economicus that's trying to do the best possible job. And then as a third solution, we're looking at the same thing but with a small difference, namely that whenever a queue grows large and there is a risk for spillover effect, then we would first clear this queue before we go back to the waiting time minimization. And we call that another regarding self regulation approach. Now, let's see what comes out of this. As the capacity of the intersection is increasingly used, we find, of course, an increasing queue length of vehicles. And for the top down regulation, we basically find a linear dependency. What happens uh, for the selfish optimization according to the homo economicus approach that I discussed before? Well, much better outcomes, much shorter queue lengths as you can see over here. So we can say that Adam Smith's invisible hand works perfectly over here. But unfortunately, the coordination breaks down before the maximum capacity utilization is reached. And uh, things get really bad so that the traffic control center would say, look, this is why you need us. But in fact, there is this third organization principle, the other regarding self-regulation. And while the, the selfish self-organization was failing at large utilizations, the other regarding self-regulation approach is actually bringing the invisible hand to work. It's much, much better all over the way. And so bottom-up self-regulation can outsmart optimal top-down control. It organizes beautiful green waves based on local interactions. And it's actually beneficial for motorized traffic, for public transportation, and for pedestrians and cyclists. I mean, everyone has to wait for a shorter time, surprisingly. And it's also good for the environment. Now, the question is, couldn't we transfer the wonderful self-regulation principles also to our economy and to the society? And I think actually this would be possible and we can learn how to do this. There is some evidence. Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom has shown that self-governance can be efficient given proper design principles. So again, it's a matter of the social mechanisms on which the system is based. And what are, one of these mechanisms that would work, I believe, for a globalized world are reputation systems. And because they are so useful, they are spreading so quickly all over the web. In fact, a colleague of mine, Andreas Dickmann, and his collaborators have shown that reputation and recommender systems can be good both for customers and sellers. Customers would get a better service, uh, can trust the, the service much more, and the sellers could get a higher price for their products. So, it's good for everyone, but actually we need to pay attention how to build the reputation and recommender system, because we could easily end up in a filter bubble such that you won't be able anymore to see the real world in an objective way. And so the question is how to build collective intelligence, how to build super intelligence. And if we think about it actually, top-down decision making cannot do it because then it's basically the intelligence of one mind or one computer. Majority decision-making is somewhat better, but also it doesn't take all the wisdom on board. And it's very interesting to look into the Netflix challenge to understand what is the winning strategy. 
is not to be the best team. So in the Netflix challenge, teams had basically to improve predictions about the movies that customers would like to see. They had to improve Netflix algorithm by 10% only. And actually there were hundreds of teams that signed up for this and it took more than two years actually to meet this challenge. It turned out no single team could do that. And then finally the winning strategy was that the best team was basically teaming up with other teams and they were averaging over the predictions of these different teams and turned out to give a better solution. And that's something that they consistently found, so we can say it's actually diversity that is the winning strategy. And so the wisdom of crowd requires independent exploration and then a suitable integration of that information. How to exactly do that is still a very intensive field of research and I'm very excited to be also part of this community. Now, there is another important development here, namely that I believe we are entering an area of social inspired technology. We, we can learn a lot from the success principles of our society and our economy. And there's this beautiful paper by Louis Fersha, Paul Lukovic, and others that are suggesting that we can actually use these social mechanisms to that technological system come up with cooperation and self-regulation, trust, reputation, social norms, culture, and many more things. And that has a tremendous economic value because take Facebook or Twitter or other social media platforms, they're built on very simple social mechanisms, but you know these companies are worth many billions. So I've also been thinking about social information technologies and how we could actually use variable computing in order to improve social economic interactions. And for this, let us classify the kinds of interactions that can happen between two people or two companies. We could have lose-lose situations, which are bad for both sides, and those situations would have to be avoided, so we basically need to increase awareness to avoid this situation. We could also have win-win situations, and in these situations people should engage into the interactions, they should know it's good for them, and they may want to improve the fairness of outcomes. But there could also be win-lose situations. There are two types of them. In the case of bad win-lose situations, one of them actually benefits and the other one has a deficit. And altogether, in the bad in new situation, uh, it would deteriorate the overall systemic outcome. So these are situations that we should better avoid, but there is an incentive that one side exploits the other and we would have to protect the other side from such exploitation. And finally, in good win new situations, there would be a beneficiary and a loser, but the situation can be turned into a win-win situation by a value transfer. So, as a consequence of this, we would require a number of social information technologies. Technology to support situational awareness, and I call this the social mirror technology to facilitate profitable interactions, and I call this the social or intercultural adapter, and then also technology to avoid lossful interactions, which I call the social protector, and finally technology to incentivize favorable interactions and to support value transfer, and I call it social or qualifying money. So, the social mirror would really be there to measure externalities of human activities. I mean, basically, to make us aware of the implications of our decisions and actions for the environment, for others, and for ourselves. 
and the social or intercultural adapter would actually be focused on the interactions between two people or two companies. We know it's pretty difficult to understand what other people want, why they do certain things, and particularly if they have different cultural backgrounds. So, while we today have technology that translates one language into another, in the future we would have technology that helps us understand other cultures, other people's expectations and wishes, and would support us in making good deals with each other. And there would be this uh, social protector to protect people from exploitation, and that's kind of connected to the idea of crowd security. Together we are strong and we can protect people or companies from exploitation in undesirable cases. And finally, I think what we really need is to have multi-dimensional incentive and reward systems. Our current monetary system has a number of serious weaknesses. It has this terrible instability and the euro currency is under big pressure. And it's largely because of a lack of flexibility. We need to have more control parameters in order to be able uh, to run self-regulating systems. And that requires this multi-dimensional approach. So, what would be the next step? Well, I think we should create a planetary system as the future ICT community has proposed it. And it actually went into this beautiful book on the human face of big data. This would be something like a software layer on top of the Internet of Things that would create awareness and support us in taking better decisions, more effective actions, allow us uh, to cooperate better. But, you know, such a system would be based on billions of sensors potentially and we shouldn't feel like a walking sensor platform that is spied on. We need to feel comfortable about this. So it's very important to build a system that we can trust and that's also recognized actually by this uh, consumer data privacy bill of rights that you can find uh, on the White House's web pages. And it says that trust is essential to maintaining the social and economic benefits that network technologies bring to the United States and the rest of the world. And I couldn't agree more. But for this now, there is a new platform available. Open Personal Data Store allows people to manage their own personal data. And so we can claim back ownership and we can better protect our privacy with such kind of technology. So this would be an important element actually to manage the tremendous data streams of the Internet of Things. And I think it's also important that it would be an open, transparent and participatory system, a system that benefits everyone, politics, business, science and the citizens. And for this we would have uh, to create options and opportunities. And one of these opportunities would arise through creation of a micropayment system. So everyone could actually earn some money on the data created and on the things that are derived from these kind of data through algorithms and intelligence on top of data. And through this openness and participatory approach, we could very quickly grow something like an information innovation ecosystem. So basically, you know, I could take some data, some algorithms for free or for a small fee. I could modify the algorithms. I could upload them again. Somebody else could take it, change it again, put it back into one. So within a very short time, we would have a huge amount of functionality and opportunities so everyone could really largely benefit from such a system. And so what I'm proposing is in order to have such a system that we can trust, that we can participate in, we should build the Internet of Things 
and the penetrative nervous system as a citizen web in the first place. So the citizen would deploy the sensors, not the company or the state, but uh, the citizens would do that and therefore they would have control over the information flows and they could feel comfortable about them. So it would work pretty much like Wikipedia with a lot of voluntary contributions and uh, we've actually started to build the system and uh, now it's basically an opportunity for everyone to join in this activity. What we're doing at the moment is we're opening up sensor data from smartphones but we're also involving external sensors and we're doing it in a way that uh, respects privacy. So here you can see some of the data that we are reading out and uh, this is an example for auxiliary meter data and just two examples for what you could do with it is well, you could measure rotums collectively by use of this auxiliary meter data you would not even have to go to the road you would get that from the sensor data or we could collectively sense earthquakes and warn our friends and family and colleagues. So many more opportunities would come up and basically the goal is to create a real-time measurement system of the world. And we would do it with a maker spirit. So pretty much based on fun and on exploration. And you can see over here now how much interest and excitement that arises in people. So, the goal is that in a few years that would actually spread all over the world and we would have a global community of people growing the system together and I'd like to invite you to participate in this so we would all be creating this planetary system together and use its benefits. Thank you very much.